Hi friend and welcome to this video. Today we're going to be looking at some of the refutations against the death and resurrection of Jesus and we are going to meet the objections with philosophical common sense. I hope this will be a great video for you. If you're an apologist and a budding apologist, you can use these points to defend your faith against the attacks of atheists and unbelievers, and perhaps other faiths who hate Christianity. So if this is a video for you, if you're looking to defend your faith and looking at apologetics. Now don't forget, if you like this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and let me know what you think in the comments below. So let's get into it. Now, there are certain um, ideas that people do not believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Some people think that, well, Jesus just, um, you know, fainted and he didn't really die on a cross. Even Muslims refute the death of the cross, the Jesus dying on the cross. So, number one, the first point I want to say is that Jesus did in fact die and here's how we know. Jesus could not have survived the crucifixion. Roman procedures were very careful to eliminate that possibility. Roman law even laid the death penalty on any soldier who let a capital prisoner escape in any way, including the bungling of a crucifixion. The second point is the fact that the Roman soldier did not break Jesus' legs, as he did to the other two crucified criminals in John 19 verses 31 to 33. That means that the soldier was sure that Jesus was dead. Breaking the legs hastened the death so that the corpse could be taken down before the Sabbath. John 19 verse 31 for that. John, an eyewitness, certified that he saw blood and water come from Jesus' pure side. This shows that Jesus' lungs had collapsed and he had died of asphyxiation. Any medical expert can vouch for this fact. Fourth, the body was totally encased in winding sheets and entombed, thus proving the fact that Jesus, in fact, was dead. The fifth, to support the death of Jesus, is the post-resurrection appearances convinced the disciples, even doubting Thomas, that Jesus was gloriously alive. It is psychologically impossible for the disciples to have been so transformed and confident if Jesus had merely struggled out of a swoon, uh, badly in need of a doctor. A half-dead, staggering sick man who has just had a narrow escape is not worshipped fearlessly as divine lord and conqueror of death. Now, how were the Roman guards at the tomb overpowered by a swooning corpse or by an unarmed or by unarmed disciples? How? Well, and if the disciples did it, they knowingly lied when they wrote the Gospels, and we are into the conspiracy theory, which we will refute here shortly. Now, how could a swooning half-dead man have moved the great stone at the door of the tomb? Who moved the stone, if not an angel? No one has ever answered that question. An eighth response would be, if Jesus awoke from a swoon, where did he go? Think this through. You have a living body to deal with now, not a dead one. Why did it disappear? A man like that, with a past like that, would have left traces. But apparently, he left without a trace, proving his divinity. As a matter of fact, his resurrection and ascension to heaven. Most simply, um, the swoon theory necessarily turns into the conspiracy theory or the hallucination theory for the disciples testified that Jesus did not swoon but really died and really rose. Jesus wasn't some faint and didn't some pretender who fainted on the cross and fainted and somehow um, you know got through this whole thing through some conspiracy. No, it, it's impossible based on what happened. Now the refutation of the conspiracy theory is this. And the essential question we're answering is why couldn't the disciples have made up the whole story? Well, the first point is that uh, Pascal, he gives a simple, psychologically sound proof for why this is unthinkable. Here Pascal writes, The hypothesis that the apostles were knaves is quite absurd. Follow it out to the end and imagine these twelve men meeting after Jesus' death and conspiring to say that he had risen from the dead. This means attacking all the powers that be. The human heart is singularly susceptible to fickleness, to change, to promises, to bribery. One of them had only to deny his story under these inducements, or still more because of the possible imprisonment, tortures, and death, and they would all have been lost. So follow that out. Think about it. Number two, second point to battle the conspiracy theory idea that Jesus was just, you know, whisked away and he had a whole team to get him out of the situation. Well, if they had made up the story, the disciples, they were the most creative, clever, intelligent fan uh, fantasists in history, far surpassing Shakespeare or Dante or Tolkien, um, you know, 
Fisherman's fish stories are never that elaborate, uh, that convincing, or that life-changing and that enduring. Thirdly, the disciple's character argues strongly against such a conspiracy on the part of all of them, with no dissenters. They were simple, honest, common peasants, not cunning, conniving liars. They weren't even lawyers. They were simple fishermen, most of them. Their sincerity is proved by their words and deeds. They preached a resurrected Christ, and they lived a resurrected Christ. They willingly died for their conspiracy. Conspiracy in quotes, okay? Nothing proves sincerity like martyrdom, and many of them died for their faith. Um, most people would not be willing to die for a conspiracy. Number four. There could be no possible motive for such a lie. Liars are always told for some selfish, sorry, lies are always told for some selfish advantage. So what advantage did the conspirators derive from their lie? They were hated, scorned, persecuted, excommunicated, imprisoned, tortured, exiled, crucified, boiled alive, you name it, the list goes on. This is what they had gone through. They were roasted, beheaded, boiled, disemboweled, fed the lions. I mean, would really people go that far for a lie? No. Let's look at reality here, man. It's true. These men had witnessed the life, death, and resurrection of God Almighty, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it's real. And now we're willing to die for the truths that they held and be tortured for the truths that they held. Now, fifth, if the resurrection were a lie, the Jews would have produced the corpse and nipped this uh, feared su superstition in the bud. All they had to do was go to the tomb and get it. The Roman soldiers and their leaders were on their side, not the Christians. And if the Jews couldn't get the body because the disciples stole it, how did they do that? The arguments against the swoon theory hold here too. Unarmed peasants could not have overpowered Roman soldiers or rolled away a great stone with guards while guards slept on duty. It's impossible. That stone would make way too much noise. The disciples could not have gotten away with proclaiming the resurrection in Jerusalem uh, same time, same place, full of eyewitnesses, if it had been a lie. If there had been a conspiracy, it would certainly have been unearthed by the disciples' adversaries, who had both the interest and the power to expose any fraud. Common experience shows that such intrigues are inevitably exposed. Um, refutation of the hallucination theory are, there's several arguments for it. Um, if you thought you saw a dead man walking and talking, wouldn't you think it more likely that you were hallucinating than, than you were seeing correctly? Why then not think the same thing about Christ's resurrection, right? So let's refute the hallucination theory, that people just hallucinated this. Well, number one, there's too many witnesses. To have so many witnesses hallucinating, apparently, is way out of the norm and statistically very impossible. Um, second, the eyewitnesses were qualified. They were simple, honest, moral people who had first-hand knowledge of the facts. Um, qualified witnesses. Number three, the witnesses saw Christ together at the same time and place. How likely is it that the same people in the same time and place all hallucinated at the same time? It's very unlikely. Hallucinations usually last a few seconds or minutes, rarely hours. And uh, this uh, apparent hallucination hung around for 40 days. That's Acts chapter 1 verse 3, okay? People don't hallucinate for 40 days. Jesus was. He lived, died, and rose again, and people saw that. Hallucinations usually happen only once, except for the insane. And uh, this, you know, apparent hallucination returned many times to ordinary people. Uh, you can read uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 3, and in, in, in the Gospel of John for all of that, from chapter 20 to 21. Okay, Hallucinations come from within, from what we already know, at least unconsciously. This one said and did surprising and unexpected things. Just check out Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and verse 9. Um, so this one said and did surprising and unexpected things like a real person and unlike a dream. So there's no hallucination. My seventh response to the hallucination theory is that not only did the disciples not expect this, they didn't even believe it at first. Neither Peter, nor the women, nor Thomas, nor the eleven. They thought he was a ghost. He had to eat something to prove he was not a ghost. It's Luke chapter 4, or Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 43. Um, who hallucinations do not eat? The resurrected Christ did on at least two occasions. You can read in Luke chapter 24, verses 42 to 43, and John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Um, the disciples, in fact, touched him. He was real. It wasn't a hallucination. And Matthew 28 tells us, Luke 24, and John 20 all tell us that. I can keep on going through the points that this obviously what they experienced was not a hallucination, but I think at this point, if I were to go any more, I'd be exhausting you. 
so let's go to another one the refutation of the myth theory so myth theory we're going to beat that one down the style of the gospels is radically and clearly different from the style of all the myths any literary scholar who knows and appreciates myths can verify this there are no overblown spectacular childishly exaggerated events nothing is arbitrary everything fits in and everything is meaningful the hand of a master is at work here um, psychological depth is at a maximum in myth it is at a minimum in myth such spectacular uh, external events happen that it would be distracting to add much internal depth of character um, and then I say this point too because if you look at um, if you look at other religions okay look at uh, the Bhagavad Gita and other religious Hindu texts and you can look at other religions too but they have really they have really um, spectacular external events without depth of character and I think that's actually one of the hallmarks of false religion it's real it's lacking depth so um, what else can I say here? Let's look at a second problem. The second problem is that there was not enough time for myth to develop in the whole thing. So we're blowing out myth theory here, that the resurrection and death is, is just a myth. It's not a myth. Okay, so the original, the original D mythologers uh, pinned their case onto a late second century date for the writing of the Gospels. Several generations have to pass before uh, basically, several generations have to pass before the added mythological elements can be mistakenly believed to be facts. Um, Julius Muller challenged his 19th century contemporaries to produce a single example anywhere in history of a great myth or legend arising around a historical figure and being generally believed within 30 years after the figure's death. And no one has really answered him uh, adequately and rightly. Um, there are other ways to debunk the myth thing the myth theory that this whole thing is a myth um i got more but i think at this point it'd be exhausting in that respect too uh, what we believe in as christians it's not myth it's not fairy tale it's not hallucination we can look at, at historically we can look at it philosoph uh, philosophically wise like as we're doing now and it just tells me completely that Jesus is Lord God, our Savior. He loves us. He bled and died for us. And he is with us through his Holy Spirit, even in heavenly sanctuary right now, praying for us and just being that mediator that we so desperately need and desire. So I hope and I pray today that this message and this video has been helpful for you. Please defend the faith. Be an apologist after God's own heart. May God bless you and keep you until we study again.